Um, an another thing I wanted to show you before we got going, uh, because a number of you are going to run into this issue, and we do cover it in one of the labs about how to include other, like, like other uh, C++ files of, of code into your current project. Uh, you you got to know that. And it's not as simple as just opening the file in Visual Studio. You have to actually like include it in your project. It's a little tedious. So I'm going to show you a quick example of this. So here, nope, not here, here. Okay, so here, this is, I mean, this is the code we've been playing around with during lecture, right? I've got a, I've got a folder, or pardon me, the, the, the solution or project is called class one. It's poorly, it's poorly named now, but whatever, there it is. And if you do something like, let's say I've got this file here and I just drag it into Visual Studio, or maybe I try to get fancy and to drag it in under source files, that's not gonna do the trick. It's not gonna work because the Visual Studio will assume that it's not a part of the project though. So here's what you're gonna wanna do. There's two main key things you're gonna wanna do. The first thing is to go to the directory or folder of where your code for this particular project is on your computer. This is gonna be a pain. So the easiest, I mean, Visual Studio makes this easy actually. All you have to do is like go to your, uh, the name of like your project here, class one, right click, open folder and file explorer. There we go. And you can see I've got hello world.cpp in there. That's, that's this file right here. Look at that, hooray. Um, if you, by the way, here, I'm just gonna close this real quick. If you accidentally do it on the solution, that's not a big problem because you'll go in here and you won't see your C++ files. Just, if you go into class one, there it is. This is, this is the folder location that we were at last time. It's just, when you did it at the one above, we went to one like folder above it. Anyways, so the first thing you wanna do is open up that location and put, um, I'll just minimize this and put a file, here's a C++ file, into that folder. There, it's there. But it's not, it's not really in the project yet though. It's in the folder, but it's not there. So after that, what you're gonna wanna do is right click on it, on your like project's name, add existing item. And then by default, it'll take you to that folder where we just put it. I'm gonna say hi.cpp and suddenly it's there and we're good to go. This will work now. If you don't do it the right way and you try to run the code in a project, it's it'll get all confused and all messed up. We're also going to do this in a lab to make it a little bit more like to give you a chance to actually do it so you'll you know, you have that experience that'll hopefully stick a little easier. But yeah, that's the idea. And now I'm going to remove this though because I don't want it anymore. Remove choose delete. Yeah, delete it. It's gone. Goodbye. Okay. Hopefully you found that helpful. Okay, uh, last time we were talking about how pointers and static arrays are kind of like the same thing, right? Like, or at least like the variables, like a static array variable really is just kind of like a pointer to the start, like the memory address where the start of the array is, which is pretty neat. So it's kind of just like a pointer. So if we go back with the slides, you'll, like we, we were doing this last time. Uh, see, like we had int star and array. You can actually treat a pointer and then index the integer pointer like an array. And similarly, uh, you can, well, of course, you can index it uh, an array with square brackets. Uh, what's pointed to, yeah, okay, there we go. What's pointed to, well, it's this actual array here. This is the one it's using, okay. So we've created all these arrays of fixed size. When I say my int, or pardon me, array, blah, 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 int my array five, that goes and the computer says, okay, I'm gonna go allocate five chunks of RAM, five available chunks of RAM that are in like, you know, contiguous space. And that's where I'm gonna store the information. I mean, we did see that we can actually use more than the five that we have created for ourselves, but we really shouldn't be doing that. But here, there we go, int my array five, length five, there we go, perfect. But here we've got a bit of a problem because the size of this array is always going to be five. It's never not going to be five. We write this code, I hit run, this array is always going to be size five. And we might not know how long the array should be. Imagine for a second, you've got, like, like hard coding it might be fine if you wanna have an array hold like very specific, informa specific information. Maybe you want to hold, you want an array of size seven to hold the strings of the names of the week. There, good, that, that unless we as humans uh, change how many days of the week we have, 
we're probably going to be fine with creating that array as a static array and just storing those strings and they're great. But imagine you're loading in a file of arbitrary size. You don't know. You want to open up this file. You don't know how it is, but you want to store that information. So you don't know how big that array needs to be. So, I mean, a reasonable thing you might want to do is ask the user, like, well, okay, you're going to start loading in data. How, like, how much data? And then maybe I can do something like, like this, right? Uh, get some size and then do C in to get the size, an integer, and then create the static array of whatever that size is. You can't do that. It won't let you do that. This can't be a variable. It can be a variable if you set it to a constant, but this right here, no, you're not allowed. You can't do this. C++ won't let you. And you're going to find this rather annoying because, well, I mean, I need to know, like, I don't know how long this array is and I need an array of arbitrary size. You can't do that. So if you don't know how big your array needs to be, this might not be a big deal for you because like, if you want to store input from an array, but you don't know how many things they'll be inputted, but you know that it's going to be less than a hundred, you can just make the static array of size 100 and then just use what you need. Sure, you're wasting space, but maybe this isn't that big of a deal for you. So maybe maybe I'm gonna read from a file and I know that the file is gonna contain no more than uh, a thousand bits of information. Maybe I, when I say bits, I don't mean like binary bits, I meant the pieces of information. Then I can just make the array of size 1,000, and maybe the file only has uh, 421, so I use that much space, and the rest of the space is just kind of left empty, which is fine, I guess. Uh, now, so that is one of the the, the tips and uh, things to be aware of of static arrays. Static arrays also have a bit of a benefit too, based on where in RAM we store this stuff. Um, but more on this a little later in the course. If, so by the way, there is a, uh, from the standard library, an array implementation that you can use. Uh, here's an example of me using it. Y you can use this if you want in this course. I'm not gonna make you uh, use the regular old arrays if you don't want to, but we are gonna be using the regular old arrays to do a lot of the more sophisticated stuff later. But if you really wanted to use the standard libraries array, which has a little bit more fancy stuff in it, for example, you can uh, create, uh, you can ask the array how big it is, right? But the way you do it is you say, well, okay, from the standard library, colon, colon, you know, namespace, array. And then in these triangle brackets, we're saying two pieces of information. We're saying one, well, it's, its type is gonna be integer and uh, we need five things. It's going to be size five. That's what's in these like triangle brackets or the, the less than and greater than symbol. And here's an example of using it. I don't really use this. Maybe I should, but I, I don't. Anyways. Yeah. So that's it for the static arrays. Uh, don't save. Oops. Yep. Uh, now dynamic arrays. All right. So, I mean, presumably you knew that if I was talking about static arrays, there might be something not static. There might be a non-static version of the array. So the reason we have two different versions of the array is like a static versus dynamic is one of the, one of the arrays is, is stored in heap space on RAM and another one is in like the stack. More on this later in the course. So let's not worry too, too much about this uh, engineering principle, but the different types of arrays are actually stored in different pieces of RAM, which kind of have pros and cons to the two of them. Now, before I jump into the, the dynamic arrays though, I'm curious, does anyone have any questions about the static arrays so far? Now's the time to ask, because we're about to move on past them. All right. Uh, well, seeing nothing, but do f obviously do feel free to uh, ask a question, raise your hand, put something in the chat, whatever. Uh, if you do think of something, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll uh, do my best to answer it. So, dynamic arrays. Oh, speak of the devil. What do we got here? Did I hear? Yep. Yeah, you can ask it. So the regular old arrays are too dumb. You, you can't ask it. You just have to know how long that array is. Uh, with the standard libraries, the standard libraries version of the array has, uh, it stores that information as an attribute. 
which is cool, which is cool. But we're going to be moving past this, and we're going to be using lists soon anyways, which are even better than the arrays. All right, so the point of this lecture is we're going to learn a little bit about this dynamic, our static and dynamic memory. I guess we'll talk about that here. I thought it was a little later in the course, and we're going to learn about dynamic arrays and learn why they're awesome and learn how annoying they are also. So RAM, memory. Variables we've made, whether it's a regular old variable or an array, like a regular old, something like an integer, a character, or whatever, uh, they're known at compile time, right? When I write the code and I set it, what I mean is something like this. Uh, like if I, in here, here, like this, here. At compile time, the computer knows, okay, well, they're making an array of size five with these values in it, and it's not going to change. If I say int a equals 40 or 33, like, okay, cool. Like it knows that a should store the four, the 33 at compile time. I don't have to hit run um, and then wait for some computing to take place before this stuff is known. This is known because it's like, it's set there. I, I wrote this code there. Yeah, all right, I guess I have an example. So, okay, I'll go set a chunk of RAM for an integer. Okay, I'll find room for a double and int my array okay 10 all right i'll find a contiguous chunk of ram for 10 integers no problem i'll find it in ram okay cool but we want to be able to do something like this obviously for for many obvious reasons including the example we just talked about like well what if you don't know the size of the array or this, the amount of information in a file we want to read or like how many things someone is buying at a store and we want to store the the products they're buying in an array but i don't know how many there are so like we want to be able to do something like this, but we can't. We can't. C++ won't let us do it this way. It makes sense that this isn't allowed, though, because how can the computer know how much RAM to set aside before the program starts to run, right? Like, when we talk about knowing stuff at compile time, when I build the project, the computer goes, okay, so they're setting this value. Like, I'm creating an array of size 10. Okay, I know that. I need to go find a chunk of RAM size 10 and I'm good to go. And then the program starts running and you know, it's all happy. But in this scenario, it doesn't know, like this is a variable, some size, this could be an arbitrary size. So the computer won't know before it starts running, like how much RAM it needs. So this is gonna be a bit of a problem. Now we're 100% allowed to change the contents of the variables during runtime. It's about the creation and allocation of RAM for those variables. So do, do note that. I'm not, like what I'm saying here is, like an int, I can change this to 44, but the, the space in memory, pardon me, during runtime, I can change the value of an int, but the amount of space and how much, like what needs to be allocated is known at runtime. Like an int, I need to go make a variable in RAM for an int. And similarly with arrays, like it knows, it needs to know how much RAM it needs and where we're going to put this in RAM. But then once, once it's created, we can change the values inside those pieces of RAM, but we can't like allocate or take up more RAM. Yeah. Okay. We're just not allowed to start allocating different amounts of memory during runtime. Or can we? Well, there's static memory and this is like the computer sets everything up when our program starts. This is what this is things like those those like the static arrays and n int equals 10. This is this information is no before we even start running. So it can go set up all those things up. Uh, does the memory needed for an int change depending on what's in it? Like does 10 take up more space than 100? No. We were actually talking about this in lab last week, right? Because uh, so it loads up. I'll, I'll get to your other question in a second. Um, but to answer your question, um, uh, Kimberly, the the an integer in RAM is going to take a, a, a standard integer in RAM is going to take up 32 bits or four bytes. There's 32 ones and zeros. If we are storing the value zero, well, that's just 32 zeros. If we're storing the value one, that's 31 zeros with a one at the far least significant uh, digit or bit space. So all the integers that can fit within 32 bits are gonna take up the, the same amount in RAM, no matter what. So that's a really good question. And I mean, it would seem natural, like, well, if I've got an integer that's only the number like uh, like one, 
I mean, really I only need like one bit to store that, right? So why can't I just be efficient and store, you know, store this in like one bit of RAM? Well, that's going to be problematic because we want, uh, we want to be able to perhaps change the values inside those chunks of RAM to anything that could be stored in 32 bits. Uh, and as we saw in lab, we can actually make an integer 64, which allows us to store much bigger numbers that could be represented with 30 or 64 bits, which is like a bajillion numbers. Um, but with only 32 bits, we're actually capped at about a little more than our close to like four and a half billion unique numbers, which is interesting. But anyways, um, yes, they all take up the same amount, four bytes, 32 bits with C++. And then there's another question. So it loads up all the RAM it needs for variables and then runs top to bottom. Effectively, yes, you can think of it like that. Is it's going to say, oh, okay, uh, I need in this code right here, I need uh, to create an integer called A, stores 33, and an integer array of size 5 that stores this value. Okay, great, done, awesome. So it goes and allocates that RAM for those variables, and then it, you know, it starts doing its thing. Uh, so, okay, static memory. Computer sets everything up when our program starts. Stack memory. Things allocated during runtime. But C++ takes care of the allocation and deallocation of the memory for us. So variables and functions, for example, they exist when the function is running but are deleted or you know, deleted or just not used anymore once the function ends. What do they, I have the asterisk there. Maybe I put it in my notes. Depends though. Yeah, of course it does depend. Um, so in this example right here, uh, you know what? I'm going to write a simpler function. Okay, great. So in this example here, if I were to run this and call this function, the, the stack memory, this like ASD, the variable ASD does not get created at the start. What'll happen is, you know, the, the program's running, it's doing its thing, and then finally it gets to the function uh, what one. And then what'll happen is it'll go to this here, create something called like a, a, a call frame, something like that. Um, and then this goes and creates some memory. It has to allocate memory for ASD. Then it'll do ASD plus one and return the value. And then as soon as this function finishes executing, ASD, like it can be rewritten. It's gone. We don't care about it anymore. It's gone. So this was like dynamically allocated, but C++ took care of this for us. Because, okay, this got created at start. This got created at the start. This here, oh, it got created at runtime. We did something with it and now we're done with it. It gets deleted. C++ took care of this for us. Uh, now we have something called dynamic memory. We can allocate and deallocate memory to our heart's content here. And I mean, technically RAM is a limited resources, so we might not get allocated, but this is exceptionally unlikely on our computers. Uh, if this was like 1984, maybe this would be more likely, or if we're doing some programming on very small little like systems with very little RAM, this could happen. Like if I tried, if I had a little computer I was writing code for that only had like uh, 256 uh, megs of RAM and I tried to allocate like 4 billion integer array, uh, that wouldn't work. I can't, I can't, there's not enough RAM for that. Um, but we have dynamic memory. This is where we can say, okay, no, no. I wanna create an array of whatever the hell size I want. So the computer needs to go and dynamically allocate chunks of RAM in, um, in this like dynamic space. So long story short though, we can actually have an array that has a size not known until runtime. And here's how we're gonna do it. But you'll notice that we're gonna do this with the pointer syntax, not really the array syntax. So here I'm creating a variable of type integer pointer and it's called A. And then I do this. A equals new int of size whatever. This syntax is quite different than the static arrays. I mean, there's some similarity here, but there's quite a bit different. I'm using this new keyword. I've got the, the square brackets next to the type on the right-hand side of the equation. 
it's an integer pointer, not like int a square brackets, you know, it's completely different. And of course I can do this all on one line of code. I can say int star a equals new int some value. I put it on two lines of code here because here I'm doing the declaration and then here I'm actually assigning the value, but new. So new is a special operator that in this context tells the computer to go make the array in memory somewhere and return a pointer to me to the memory address of where it starts. So new like goes and creates it. And then once it's created a pointer to where it was started, like the, the memory address of the first uh, thing in that array, index zero is going to be stored in A. So A is a pointer. And by the way, this right here, this syntax and doing it this way with like a dynamic array, this is, this is how it works in Python really when we're creating lists. It's always like, okay, something, okay, we go create a new one and then we get a pointer to it because all lists were pointers. We never actually had a list. We always had a pointer to a list. It's here though, we're up here. We've got a pointer to the start of an array. So dynamic arrays don't panic. It's a pointer, but remember we can use the square brackets to index pointers. So here's a good example of like, okay. And we saw this at the last, last lecture, right? How, you know, we can, we can get information from these things from either using the pointer syntax or array syntax. But if I did something like this, int star a equals a new int some value, I can index this, uh, this pointer with the square brackets. Cause it's like, it'll just do that pointer arithmetic for us, right? What it'll do is first time through the loop, I is zero. So we'll say, okay, go to that memory address, add I, which is zero, add zero to that memory address, and then put in the value I zero then go to that memory address plus one assign a value that memory address plus two and assign a value and so on though if you really like you can stick with the pointer arithmetic but i don't recommend it no one would recommend this <laughs> although i think i do make you do it in a lab just for fun uh just so you get a chance to play around with it but in practice you wouldn't do that because that's and maybe i can imagine a world where maybe you do it for a reason but almost always you're not going to want to do that like actual pointer arithmetic where you like take the pointer, add the value, dereference it, and then assign the value. Just, just do it this way. Do dynamic arrays come with object methods akin to lists in Python? No, but you actually are. Okay. The, the answer to the question is no, but once we start writing our own objects, we are going to, uh, can we wipe actually the computer? Okay. I'll, I'll answer that question. Cause it's really easy. Is the computer will return like C plus plus will return an exception. That's like, ah, I can't assign all this memory. So we're, we're actually safe there, but dynamic arrays don't come with object methods. Uh, we don't get them, but we will be using them to write our own classes and accessing them with like point, like these classes we're writing and instantiating objects. Um, when we, when, We'll do that. We'll be using arrays and we'll be accessing them through pointers. So we don't have them here, but we will be writing our own objects. Like we will be writing our own list class where we will be doing and making it basically work just like Python's. Uh, oh. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so why not always use dynamic arrays then? Well, there are some overhead associated with them because, and I'm going to warn you, this gets kind of confusing. When I do this int star a, and then I say a equals new int some value. And then immediately after I say, ah, a equals another new int, uh, some other value. So here's what's happening. One, we made a variable for an integer pointer called a. Then we made an integer array, got its memory address and then put it in a. Then we made another integer array, got its memory address and put it in a. This is bad. Let me draw. See if I can do this today. Aha. And then I think if I, no, this one, no. Hmm. All right. Uh, so what's happening is I have a, and here's my box, right? That's what happened on this line of code. Then this line of code's happening. We're going to say, okay, new int some value, whatever. It's going to go and then, oh, I guess over here in Ram. <laughs> okay. We get a pointer to here. And the computer goes, yeah, I've allocated this for you. This right here, this belongs to you program. You have this and we're all happy. Cause I guess some value was one, two, three was four, I guess. So here we've allocated it. 
and this memory is assigned to you, program. Great. So this takes up some space in RAM. I mean, not very much, obviously. Four bytes each times four. So we've got 16 bytes of RAM. Not a lot, right? That's, that's itty bitty. But, you know, it takes up space. I mean, I guess I could have made some value a billion, let's say. So we've gonna, we're going to have a heck of a lot of RAM being taken up. But okay, whatever. We've done that, and then we assign it to A because this returned the memory address. I don't know. Maybe this is like OX44. Uh, it just happens to be memory address 44, so we put the 44 in here. OX, you know. Then immediately below, we say, oh, okay, no, 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 no. Go make another chunk of RAM. I don't know. Maybe it's over here. Uh, I'm just going to draw on top because whatever. And we assign this chunk of RAM now. And the computer goes, oh, okay, great. I've got this chunk of RAM. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, I guess seven. Seven spaces. I guess some other value had seven in it. And we've allocated this chunk of RAM to our program. So, the, you know, everything, everyone's happy. We're, this is great, you know, perfect. We've allocated this chunk of RAM. I mean, we've also allocated this chunk of RAM, but we've allocated this one. But the problem now shows up when we say, okay, A equals this. So here's what happens. This pointer disappears. I mean, this still is at memory address 44, but this gets overwritten with wherever the memory address of this starts. So maybe this is OX 107F24, whatever, right? So now we've got a bit of a problem. This chunk of RAM over here, it's still allocated to this program. But we now have lost, I mean, the only way though that we knew, like as the programmers, the only way we knew where this chunk of RAM that the computer has allocated us, uh, where it is, is we stored where it starts in A. And then immediately we obliterated it and overwrote it with another pointer. We wrote this line of code, suddenly this chunk of RAM, we've lost reference to it. We don't know where it is anymore because we just overwrote OX44. So we don't know. And, but it's allocated to us. We have no way to get access to this chunk of RAM. This is an example of a memory leak. Uh, quick raise of hands. Uh, wait, uh, will the old RAM chunk still exist and hold the values, but we won't have a, a absolutely correct. That is, that is exactly what I'm saying, Duncan. You're absolutely correct. Now, quickly, do a raise of hands if you've ever heard the phrase memory leak before. Okay, so a, a number of people have. This is an example of a memory leak. Maybe not that big of a deal in our program when we're, you know, we're not really taking up a lot of space. When you run your program, maybe you allocated some memory to the program dynamically and you forgot, like you just, you lost reference to it. And now that chunk of RAM is forever lost while the program is running. As soon as it stops, you know, it all gets freed up. The operating system takes care of a lot of that for us. But that program does take up a little bit of space. But imagine you've got something like a video game where maybe it's doing a lot of these allocations, but they're forgetting to free up the RAM afterwards. They're forgetting that they're losing reference to it and those chunks of RAM are still assigned. Now, when you have a memory leak, the computer is just going to keep assigning new chunks of RAM for our program, but not freeing up the RAM that we're not using anymore. So our program will take up more and more and more and more space as it runs. Like, Here's what I mean. Imagine for a second, I put this code in a for loop that ran a billion times. We're going to run into a problem because we're never, we're never freeing up this RAM. We, we assign it, the computer goes, this belongs to you program, and then suddenly we lost access to it. So that's, I mean, this is brutal. We've lost it. We've lost it. This is a memory leak. Now I see Duncan has another question. What do we got? Uh, follow up. Okay, what's the follow up? <laughs> <clears throat> Cool. Yep. New variable, and it got like I, I don't know. Maybe like we forced it into uh, that same chunk of RAM that we had previously used. Yep. Uh, if we didn't assign something immediately, so like if we didn't put something in that box, would it have the value that it had uh, when we used it beforehand? So all right, let me just see if I'm understanding what you mean. You're asking if I'm basically doing something like I just, whoop, I just so happen 
to go to this chunk of RAM, like up here, some line of code above, I happen to go to this chunk of RAM here and put the number five in it. Then, but like I did it through way where like I, I really wasn't allocated this RAM, but somehow I magically told the computer to go to this memory address, 44, and put the value five in it. The computer's gonna be mad at me because it's gonna say uh, something changed and it shouldn't have changed like we saw in the last lab. But then we come along and it just so happens that this, this line of code goes into site, like goes, oh, okay, let's, uh, let's put the array right here. Yes, that value will still be in there and it will be allocated, but we've got a little bit of an issue. So the question you're asking, it's a good question, but it's an example of basically how abusive can we be to our RAM and computer? <laughs> Anyways, this bad. Is there a clear RAM command for dynamic? No, there is not, but there is. <laughs> It's not a, just a general function or a command where it says, okay, go clear up the rest of RAM. We have to specifically do this, delete. So if I have int star A and I create a new array, this is saying like, okay, we've got, you know, this chunk of RAM. Then immediately after though, I'm saying, okay, delete A. And here's what happens. The, okay. Everybody listen carefully. I cannot make this clear. Every year this becomes a bit of confusion and admittedly I have to re remember this every year too. I've got a variable called a that's an integer pointer. It's pointing us to the beginning of RAM. When I say delete a, it does like a is left alone. A, this is left alone. In fact, this could be like made at, at compile time because all it needs to know is, oh, I'm making a variable A that's gonna hold a memory address, an integer pointer. What's dynamically allocated is this thing, the thing that A points to. So when we delete A, this is left alone. A is left alone. What gets deleted is this. In fact, if we, if we did this and deleted it and then tried to access A, the computer might get mad at us and be like, uh, but the thing doesn't exist anymore. FYI. So when we say delete, we're not deleting the variable A, we're deleting what A is pointing to. So that's important. Pointing to in this case, because we've got an integer pointer. So this gets deleted. And we all know that when we delete something, it's not like this actually gets all assigned zeros. It just goes like, okay, well, this chunk of RAM is not used by me anymore, so it can be overwritten. So you would have to say new int something Delete it, and then another new one, and then we're good to go. There's a rule. The rule is, yeah, deletes the thing it points to. The variable a still exists, though, so it's cool to reuse it. Yeah, so we're good. Now, in this context, we must make sure to use the square brackets in this situation. We're saying delete this. This means delete the array, okay? It's possible to create uh, other things. We can put other things. Oh, okay, I was just about to say this. Uh, we can put other things in dynamic memory as well. Here, what I'm doing is I'm creating an integer pointer, and this can be at compile time because an integer pointer, the computer knows, oh, I just need to go assign some chunk of RAM that's going to hold a memory address. It can do that. And then here at runtime, it's going to go dynamically allocate uh, some chunk of RAM to store an integer, specifically the integer five, and there we go. And in this case, if I want to print it out, I would need to do dereference because if I just print out my int pointer, it's just a pointer. So I dereference to what it's pointing to. But new, that tells us, I mean, we can use that as a quick way to be like, oh yeah, this is in dynamic memory. We are saying like, go create this somewhere in dynamic memory. Why would we want to do this? Well, right now, this it's not going to seem obvious. We're going to be doing this more later in the course where it'll become very obvious why this is useful. But as of right now, it's just me showing you like, hey, look, you can do this. So here we've got a dynamically allocated thing, but we're going to need to, okay, wait, what do I have? But it ends up coming in handy when you don't have an integer variable to put into five. Okay, how many integer variables did I declare above? Yeah, okay, whatever, let's not worry about that. If you ever do this, you need delete. But notice in this case, because the integer pointer wasn't pointing to what we wanted to be like an array, it's pointing to just a regular old integer, we don't put the square brackets. So when we see the new int square brackets, like obviously this is an array, we need delete square brackets. When we do just a regular old one, we need delete just my pointer without the square brackets. It'll get mad at you if you do it wrong, so it'll help you remember. 
Uh, but yeah, there you go. Delete. The rule of thumb is for every new, you need a delete. Every time you make something new, you got to delete it. But just like with the dynamic allocated int, we must delete the int from room. Yeah. No, this time we don't need the square brackets. Yeah. Uh, int my po delete my pointer is needed when, the yeah. Okay, great. Another question. So if it was an array and you didn't put that, would it only delete the first value? Try it and see what happens. You get back to us. Okay, new and delete rule. When to delete? Well, just delete things when you don't need them anymore. And remember, we're deleting the thing, not the variable. We're deleting the thing that it's like pointing to. The thing that was like dynamically allocated. So in this case, yeah, we, we delete this. People are always like, like, when do I need to delete? Whenever you don't need it anymore. And you might say, well, I need this variable until the program's done running. Great, then at the very end of your main, delete that variable. Technically, you don't need to because as soon as the program stops, it will free up that memory. But it's definitely good practice and something I'm going to enforce to delete all of the things you don't need anymore when you don't need them anymore. And to know, wait, which things do I have to delete? All the things that have a new. Whenever you see new, you got to delete those things. My int still is there, but the five is what's deleted. Yeah, deleted. Here's a simple rule for remembering what you need. For every new, we need delete. For every new type size, we need delete. Square brackets. Okay. If you didn't use new, you don't need to delete. Asterisk. <laughs> so making use of it. All right. Well, here's an example of using a dynamically allocated array. Size. Enter size. Someone puts in a value. Maybe they say 5, 10. I don't know. So here, you know. We've got our pointer to the beginning of an array and we're saying, okay, create a new integer array, dynamic array of size five. Then here I'm gonna say, okay, for i is zero to size, put in the square of the memory address, or pardon me, the, the index, I guess. Why? Because. So we should see uh, zero, one, four, uh, you know, what comes after two, three, nine, and so on, right? All the way up to whatever size is. And then prints out the contents of the array. Great, we've got a function to print out the contents because why not? But of course, we've got these news, so we're gonna wanna delete. So when we're done, we're gonna delete our array because we're good programmers. Done, fantastic. We have no memory leak. We've created something dynamically and then we, we tell the computer, yep, I don't need it anymore, delete, goodbye. What if the computer won't allocate enough RAM? So it is possible to ask for too much RAM, but in our nice 162 world, this isn't going to happen unless you deliberately try to do it. The good news, though, is that it's going to throw an exception. It's going to say bad alloc. It's, it can't allocate that RAM. So don't worry about it. And we'll talk about exceptions later in the course. So that's about it. Now, I will say that in, uh, in C++, so C++ doesn't have what we call a garbage collector. You may have heard this phrase before, garbage collection. But it's in, in many other programming languages, when a program is running, there's another process running like with it that is going and looking through your program and looking at RAM and trying to find any things that were allocated, like an array, that we lost reference to. So the example of this. Let me share my screen again so you can actually see what I'm talking about there. This example, if this was a language like Java or something, and I said this, and then immediately I replaced it with another one of a different size, this chunk of RAM that was allocated isn't referenced anymore. That We don't have a pointer to it. We have no way of knowing where that is. So we, we've lost it, right? So we have A, we've got the box, and then over here we have some RAM, and then we've some RAM, First, A was pointing to that, and then we got rid of it, and then we pointed to that. So we've lost access to the start of this array. So we, we don't know where it is anymore. So this other process and many other with any, many other programming languages, like Python, your, your Java, this, pr this process is going to go through and be like, ah, see, see this chunk of RAM right here? Nothing references it anymore. Therefore, no one can access this chunk of RAM anymore for anything useful, so I'm just gonna free it up. So the garbage collector comes and goes, yeah, okay, we don't need this anymore. We throw it in the garbage. Uh, see, this is my garbage. <laughs> Put it in there, great. And we're good to go. 
It deletes it for us. This is fantastic. It frees up this space for us. We don't need to worry about memory leaks. C++ doesn't have this. C++, if you make something, you got to delete it. Now you might say, why the hell does it not have a garbage collector? Clearly that's going to make things great. You're, you're absolutely right. Many programming languages include the garbage collector because this is obviously really helpful. But at the same time, garbage collectors, when they're running, I mean, that is a process that needs to run. That's using your CPU. It's performing calculations. It's taking up your CPU's resources to do garbage collection for us. Where in C++, we have to do it ourselves, meaning that that process doesn't need to run, meaning that frees up more of the CPU for what we need to do. So there's these trade-offs. And always in computer science, always, 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 we're dealing with these trade-offs. And not only in the engineering side of things, like the actual like physical computers or the processes running in these programming languages, but also in the design of our data structures, also in the design of our algorithms. Sometimes you might have an algorithm like, you know, this algorithm is really fast, but it takes up a lot of RAM. Or maybe you've got an algorithm that, you know, it's a little slower, but it uses like no RAM. So, you know, we always used to, back in my day when I was doing my undergrad, um, we would always kind of like joke and talk about how, and what we talk about like the runtime speed versus space, We'll call it like uh, uh, computational complexity versus like space complexity or something. And we, we really didn't care about space complexity because we had a lot of RAM in our computers. Who cares, right? Like, oh, whatever. We've got tons of RAM. And we're not working with that much data. Have, have, have your algorithm be really, really fast, but who cares about how big it is? Now imagine like Google or Amazon today where you've just got massive amounts of data. Well, we, we, we need to be careful. And we always have to talk about these trade-offs. You might have a faster algorithm, but it takes up a lot of space, which is bad, or vice versa. There's always a catch. Okay. Uh huh. Any any last questions about these arrays? Because I believe that was it for the. Yes, that was it for these bits. So now's the time to ask. Otherwise, we're gonna move on to what do I have next? Uh, a recap, which should be quick. I don't know if we'll finish it today, but if there's no questions about the static or dynamic arrays, uh, I mean, definitely ask now, please, but uh, I'll move on to recap. I'll give you a second to ask the question if anyone has it. Oh, I see people, people leaving. <laughs> I hope you just got disconnected. Um, all right, so recap. I know we're only like, a, what, the beginning of the third, or like the third week of the semester, I'm already talking recap, but this recap is more about the C++ versus Python. So what's the recap? Well, Python, C, C++, all have different syntax, but at the end, they're really not that different. And the pointers are also pretty cool. We learned about pointers, and I mean, technically everything in like Python was a pointer, and now really it's the not pointers, which is kind of new, but you know, they're a thing. And static arrays are cool, and dynamic arrays are also pretty cool. So in Python, here's print hello world, C++, hello world. Great. Nothing crazy. Sure, there's some syntax difference, but the idea is our computer runs and it prints something out. Okay. C++, you know, by default, it didn't give us the thing to do like input output and we have to have this main function. But other than that, you know, it's just basically we're printing out. Okay. Assigning variables, well, an int, a float, a string, C++, same idea, it's just, we have to be careful. We have like we have to specify our types. Okay, great. This is not this isn't this isn't too bad at all. And of course, strings also come from the standard library, which is a weird peculiarity, I guess, if you're used to other languages. But we got to put std colon colon in front of it. Uh, here's a function. Here's a function. Look how similar they are. The only difference I really see here, uh, aside from so Python, you have to use the def keyword. You don't in C++, but in C++, you got to tell the function, like what is the return type of this function? And we've got all those variables with the types. Other than that, I guess the only difference is Python cares about the indentation where C++ doesn't, but it cares about the squiggly brackets. Uh, if statements, so if some condition, it was true, false, C++, same idea. The only difference here is the squiggly brackets and I guess we have parentheses around some bool, which you can do in Python, it'll work just fine. So this is the same. Uh, a while loop, well, here it is in Python, here it is in C++. It's, look, it's, it's the same. 
C is zero. I, okay, we have to say the type, but we know that. While some condition, while the condition, I, we have it in parentheses, and then we print out add one to C. Print out add one to C. There, that's it. That's it. It's the same. Squiggles, parentheses, types. That's it. A list. Okay, we've got four things. Four thing in a list. Print out thing. C++. Uh, an integer array. Like this one's, uh, I guess this one's a static one. And then for each thing in the array, they're all integers. Print out, print it out. S same. Syntax is different. This one, I guess, is probably the most different. Um, we have the parentheses. We have to say the type of the things. But instead of in, we use colon. So I guess it's really not too bad. Uh, Python, here's a here's like a, a counting for loop for i in range 10. C++ is one. Well, here you go. For i starting at 0, i less than 10, i++, plus plus, print it out. And of course, we do know that we can put really whatever condition we want in that middle part. But often, you're going to see this used for simple counting. Pointers, okay. Int a is 55. So let's say it just so happens that this integer gets assigned the value... 55 and we for whatever reason we put it memory address 101 uh, Can you explain the for loop in static arrays? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean Yeah, so all it means is So here's the Python one 44 23 55 11 This is a list and what this is going to say is for each thing in a list The way I always read for loops is like for each thing in some collection of things so for each individual in a list, so that's going to be 44, 23, 55, 11. We're going to run this loop and thing the first time through the loop will be 44. Then the next time it'll be 23. Then the next time it'll be 55. Then the next time it'll be 11. So for thing in a list, print out thing, 44. Loop starts again. Now thing moves to the next one, 23, 55, 11. So this loop will run one, two, three, four times. Down here, it's doing the exact same thing. The only difference really is, okay, we have to be careful of the type. And instead of saying for thing in a list, it is for, like, like it's thing colon an array. I hear I called it an array because it's an array. Uh, was, was that what you were asking? Uh, be, I mean, be honest. Tell me if I didn't answer the question at all. <laughs> uh, just haven't seen the colon before. Yeah, you know what? I actually, a lot of people love the, the for each loops. I don't use them very often myself. Um, but yeah, in the context of a for loop, it's basically like the in. You can think of it as in, like the thing in this collection of things. That's always how I think of it, at least. Hopefully it's helpful. You may never end up using these. If you don't, whatever, it doesn't matter too much. A lot of times, like you can just, in, whatever, we'll, we'll talk about these later uh, when we start talking about iterators and whatnot. Uh, okay. And then the pointers, int a 55. Well, here, this is just an integer. The integer a, I guess, uh, memory address 101 got assigned it. Note that I know I, oh no, I did put it in hexadecimal. How about that? So integer a, the variable a got assigned memory address 101, and we put 55 in it. Int star b is going to be a pointer up to an integer that is going to get us the memory address of a, which just so happened to end up in memory address 102, which, wow, what are the odds? And it stores, um, what, 104? B, oh, no, I guess int b, pardon me. I, int b doesn't go to 102. Int b goes to, do I have, oh, man, I should have drawn, drawn arrows. I can draw them here. So, should have drawn arrows because even I got confused. That's that. This is this. So, it looks like b goes to memory address 104, and it stores the memory address of a. That's this, which of course just is like that pointer. And then uh, int star star. Well, here I've made a point, an integer pointer pointer. So we've got a pointer to a pointer to an integer. So that's uh, that's this one here. So 102 is a pointer to this guy, which the type of this thing is a pointer to this guy. So there we're, we're good. So star C should be, I guess, we dereference C. Okay, C is this memory address. And then we say, oh no, C is this memory address. Then we say, okay, I dereference it. So what's inside of it? Well, it's the memory address 101. If we dereference, dereference, well, okay, memory address 101, then dereference that memory address. Uh, oh, it's 55. Static arrays, how are we on time? How much is left? Can I blitz it? No, you know what, I better not. Uh, we'll pick up there on Friday. 
Uh, otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day and see you later.